You are watching the World 24/7 on the NDTV network. I'm Parmeshwar Bhava. Let's begin with the top stories you need to know. The US president Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID but has mild symptoms. The White House has confirmed. Nearly two-thirds of Democrats say President Joe Biden should withdraw from the presidential race and let his party nominate a different candidate, according to a new poll, sharply undercutting his post-debate claim that average Democrats are still with him, even if some big names are turning on him. Trump's vice president pick, J.D. Vance, is set to make his first speech as the Republican vice presidential nominee on the third night of the Republican National Convention, with the night expected to focus on foreign policy. Britain's King Charles has set out Prime Minister Keir Starmer's legislative agenda, promising a government of service focused on reviving the economy and tackling issues from an acute housing shortage to a cost-of-living crisis. Police investigating the deaths by poisoning of six people found in the room of a luxury hotel in central Bangkok believe one member of the group took their own life and murdered the rest by lacing cups of tea with cyanide. Thai police said they believe the poisonings occurred after the group ordered food and English tea to their room on the fifth floor of the Grand Hyatt Erwan Hotel in Bangkok's commercial district. Well, our big focus, U.S. President Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID, according to the White House, forcing him to cancel an event in Las Vegas and likely sidelining him for days following the conclusion of former President Trump's nominating convention on later today, actually. Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, said in a statement that earlier today, following his first event in Las Vegas, Biden tested positive for COVID-19. She added that he is vaccinated and boosted and he is experiencing mild symptoms. She said Mr. Biden would travel from Las Vegas to Delaware where he would actually self-isolate. But if Joe Biden continues to test positive for the next week or more, it could keep him off the campaign trail. And if he continues to have symptoms, it could hamper his ability to perform well in interviews that he could do from home as well. But Joe Biden used his positive COVID-19 diagnosis to take a dig at Elon Musk and Republican opponent Donald Trump. In fact, Biden posted on X saying, I'm sick, soon after news circulated of his testing positive for COVID-19. However, he followed that up with another post that continued of Elon Musk and his rich buddies trying to buy this election. And if you agree, pitch in here. That post included photos of Musk and Trump, along with a link to a donation site for the Biden campaign. I made a serious mistake on the, in, the, in the whole debate. And, uh, and look, when I originally ran, you may remember it, I said I was going to be a transitional candidate. And I thought that I'd be able to move from this, just pass it on to someone else. But I didn't anticipate things getting so, so, so divided. And quite frankly, I think the only thing age brings is a little bit of wisdom. And I think I've demonstrated that I know how to get things done for the country, in spite of the fact that we're told we couldn't get it done. But there's more to do, and I'm reluctant to walk away from that. Hi, Benji joins us with the latest update from Ground Zero. He joins us live from Washington, D.C. at the moment. Biden's third bout with COVID, it comes as some of his allies and supporters are continuing to press for him to drop out of the race, citing concerns about his ability to defeat Donald Trump in November? Yes, well, let's start with the good news, shall we? Joe Biden says, quote, he feels good. He is vaccinated. He is boosted. Yes. As you say, this is not the first time that he's caught COVID. 
But this is a major, major blow. It comes amid those calls for him to step aside, just as he was trying to uh, withstand that pressure and uh, head out on the campaign trail. Though uh, there have been, in the past 24 hours alone, repeated demands for him to consider his position. They came firstly from Adam Schiff, a senior member of the Democrat Party, who says he has serious concerns about whether Joe Biden can defeat Donald Trump in November. On on top of that, we're learning that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, in a one-to-one -one meeting with Joe Biden, told him forcefully that the best thing he could do for the country would be to withdraw. And we're told that message is being heeded by a more receptive president. Still, so far, the 81-year-old has offered sort of a temperate defiance, though the line at which he said he step aside has certainly thinned. Initially, he said that he would only consider removing himself from the candidacy if there was some form of divine intervention. Now he says all it would take would uh, all it would take is some medical condition, not including you presume COVID nineteen. That denial still not enough to stop the flow of pressure in his direction and in a in a bid really to try to prevent Joe Biden being ousted. The Democrat National Convention, uh, Committee, I should say, is trying to bring forward the date on which he would be officially decided to be the nominee. That's not being taken well by many lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And the stark reality is also borne out in the polls, which show he is losing vast support amongst Democrat voters. Yes, thanks so much, Hi Benji, as always, for joining us with that live update from Washington. As Hai is reporting, nearly two in three Democrats say Joe Biden should step aside from the 2024 race. This as per the latest poll conducted by the Associated Press and Nork Center for Public Affairs Research. It was largely conducted prior to the assassination attempt against former President Trump over the weekend. But this poll found that 70% of voters surveyed said Biden should withdraw from the race and allow someone else to take on Trump this November. 65% of Democratic respondents said they believe Biden should step aside after his poor debate performance sparked worries about his ability to beat Trump and lead for another four years if re-elected. Only 35% of Democrats, by the way, said Biden should continue running for president. For further clarity, let's go across to Voice of America, Steve Herman, who joins us at the moment. Steve? Since this poll was conducted mostly before Saturday's assassination attempt on Trump, it's unclear whether the shooting influenced people's views of Biden. But what have you been picking up on Ground Zero? Has Saturday's attack garnered sympathy that will likely translate into electoral gains for Donald Trump? There's no evidence that it's um, moving the needle very much in right. the preliminary polling. I think what it does uh, here in Milwaukee at the Republican National Convention where thousands of delegates, diehard supporters of the party and Donald Trump have gathered, it really helps fire them up even further. And uh, what it may do is get Republicans to go out to the polls in November that might have stayed at home, um, you know, not uh, thinking that they really need to go vote to make a difference in their respective states. Right. In fact, Biden's recent diagnosis with COVID. Having COVID is all but certain to complicate the president's ability to answer his critics, right? Many of whom have said that they want him to show that he still has the vigor and energy to prosecute the case against Trump, whether it's in campaign rallies, interviews, or other events. Well, it just seems that uh, Joe Biden can't catch a good break right now. There was that uh, disastrous performance at the uh, debate and, uh, you know, the further pressure coming from prominent Democrats. We had one today, a uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, who's probably going to win the U.S. Senate seat in California this year. It was very close to former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi coming out just hours before that uh, COVID announcement saying that uh, Joe Biden needs to pass the torch. So every day, it just seems that there's a little bit more bad news for Joe Biden while the news this week here in the United States is very much focused on what's going on in this uh, building right behind me, the Republican National Convention, which is essentially a coronation for the third consecutive time for Donald Trump as the Republican Party's presidential nominee. Right. In fact, 
Trump's vice presidential pick, J.D. Vance, is set to make his first speech as the Republican vice presidential nominee where you are on the third night of the Republican National Convention. And we are hearing that the night is expected to focus specifically on foreign policy. What are the key takeaways so far? Well, the key takeaways have been very much a focus on the issue of immigration, on the issue of crime, and trying to link those two to some degree, although statistics don't necessarily show that immigrants commit more crimes than uh, people who were born in this country. And you're right, this is going to be a big night for J.D. Vance, just announced a couple of nights ago by Donald Trump as his running mate. He is a name that may not be familiar to a lot of Americans, but even before he was a senator, he had a little bit of name recognition because he wrote a book called Hillbilly Elegy, which was made into a Hollywood movie about his growing up in a very poor region of the United States, the Appalachian region, and then him going off to Yale Law School, joining the elite. And now uh, uh, perhaps uh, if Donald Trump wins in November, becoming uh, the next vice president of the United States. Right. Lots happening at the RNC where you are in Milwaukee. But separately, Steve, Biden is trying desperately to end the conversation about his cognitive capacity and address what polls suggest are three of his biggest political weaknesses, immigration, the economy and slipping support among Latinos. But the COVID diagnosis, does it mean he will not be able to mount an aggressive campaign push in the coming days as opposed to Trump's campaign? Well, certainly not in the coming days. He flew back from Las Vegas where he was to make a speech before a Hispanic group and is on Air Force One heading for Delaware. And he, we got the schedule for tomorrow. He will be there all day at Rehoboth Beach in Delaware, his house there, and nothing on his schedule whatsoever. How many more days? We don't know. That will uh, depend on uh, when he gets a negative COVID test, obviously. Right. Also, some within the GOP camp argue that Saturday's assassination attempt has practically sealed the election campaign. What are you picking up on in Milwaukee at the RNC where you are? Well, of course, that's what uh, Republicans believe. And most uh, delegates that you would ask here, uh, even without uh, the assassination attempt, would have said uh, that they believe uh, Donald Trump is going to win this election. And if he doesn't win the election, it means it is rigged, which is what uh, Donald Trump falsely claimed in the previous presidential election when he was, uh, uh, didn't win re-election. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, everyone here is outwardly going to uh, be very positive about Donald Trump's uh, chances. Right. And the others who opposed him previously all came together last night to support him. Steve, always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much for joining us with the latest. My Steve Hermans in Milwaukee at the moment, where J.D. Vance, the freshman senator from Ohio, tapped by former U.S. President Donald Trump, his running mate, he will be headlining the third night of the Republican National Convention. The third night opened with fiery speeches denouncing President Joe Biden. In fact, some within the GOP camp argue that Saturday's assassination attempt has practically sealed the election campaign. Listen in. My first question, how has the assassination attempt impacted Donald Trump's campaign strategy and messaging and uh, have there been any changes to Trump's rally and event schedule and if so what are they? This uh, particular um, event that assassination attempt has practically sealed the, uh, uh, the um, election campaign. It's, it's almost over. Uh, it's very challenging at this point for Democrats to figure out what to do, uh, because such a dark, I mean, such a contrast has been uh, laid out in the minds of the electorate that, uh, you know, on one hand, two weeks prior to this, you have this debate uh, between President Trump and President Biden, where uh, everybody recognizes including President Biden, that it was really a bad night for him. And, uh, you know, he just seemed to be lost. He didn't seem to be anywhere. Uh, I could not answer any question. 
uh, he, sloppy, uh, sleepy uh, Joe, as he's being known as. Hmm. And uh, in contrast to that, you have um, a man of steel, a fighter, uh, doesn't look like even 78 years old, that um, uh, after getting shot uh, in his right ear, uh, and fortunately, if he had uh, been looking straight, it would have gone to his head, at the bullet, uh, and the assassination attempt, and he, 30 seconds after he is taken uh, to the ground, he goes down uh, by Secret Service, uh, he gets up and has this fighting spirit, says, um, fight on, fight on, fight on. And, you know, so uh, that's what uh, Americans like to see in their president. So uh, that's why I say, as... Uh, as it stands right now, unless the Democrats come up with a different candidate, uh, and they still have a month to go, uh, unless they do something like that, this election is over. Is there a possibility of uh, rethink on the Democratic side? I mean, the other side. Uh, they they have to come up with something different. You know, they the. Uh, uh, right now, I'm still betting on last-minute um, uh, President Barack Obama convincing his wife, Michelle Obama, to step in. Then there will be a real contest. I would say probably then between Trump and Michelle Obama, there will be a contest. Between President Trump and Joe Biden, there is no contest. Between President Trump and Kamala, there is no contest. So they got to find uh, somebody else and uh, the, the, I mean, uh, inside, and, you know, I'm, I'm connected to a Democrat Hindu coalition as well. Uh, so I work with the other side as well. So they are good friends. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say behind the scenes, everybody wishes on the Democrats' part that Michelle Obama is persuaded to become the uh, Democrat nominee. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time and wishing you all the best uh, because the campaign is still heating up, as they say, and long way to go for uh, the final day on which the polling will happen. Uh, continue to, uh, to stay in touch with us. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. That was uh, Shalab Kumar, a close aide of Donald Trump and uh, someone who's involved in the entire campaign strategy of the Republicans. In other crucial news... Bangladesh deployed a paramilitary force after at least five people were killed during violent demonstrations by thousands of university students, raising the specter of instability in a country familiar with protests. For weeks, students across Bangladesh have been protesting quotas for government jobs that were recently reinstated after being abolished in 2018, following another countrywide student protest. But the protests were first started by students of the University of Dhaka and now they have spread to other universities and cities and turned increasingly political, pitting the ruling party against the opposition. Here are the details for you. Student protests escalate in Bangladesh with at least six people having been killed and hundreds injured after weeks of massive protests turned violent and shut down all schools and universities. The protests grew increasingly violent as police dispersed rallies with rubber bullets, tear gas and lobbed sound grenades, injuring dozens more. The anti-quota protesters have been demanding an end to a job quota which reserves up to 30% of government jobs to the families of veterans who fought in Bangladesh's war of independence. Protesters argue that the job quota is discriminatory and instead should be merit-based. Some have even alleged that it directly benefits groups supporting Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. According to ground reports, the protests intensified following a statement from the Prime Minister in which she used the term Razakar, which refers to people who collaborated with the Pakistani army during the 1971 independence war, to label those opposing the quotas. The protesters retaliated and started chanting slogans calling themselves Razakars. 
Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has since responded, calling the chants unfortunate and regrettable, and that the anti-quarter protesters do not feel any shame for calling themselves as such. In light of the protests, Bangladesh has ordered all schools and universities to be shut down until further notice. But as demonstrations continue and students go on to be injured, the anti-quota protests are shaping up to be the biggest challenge for Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government since winning a fourth term earlier this year. Samia Afsar for NDTV. And Ridwan Emma joins us from Dhaka for the latest from Ground Zero. Thanks so much, Ridwan, for making time for us. Now, citing the safety of students, government officials have announced that they would shut down most schools and colleges indefinitely as these protests rage on. Yes, so the, the, this instruction came on the, the day before yesterday when most of the government institutions were declared closed. And in the, yesterday, the government, especially the universities, they have instructed their students to vacate the dormitories, which the students denied. They said like, they don't want to leave the university premise. And that, you know, that fueled more protests across the university campuses in Dhaka, in the, in the outskirts, there's called Jahanginagar University where people got hurt. I mean, the students, uh, reporters, they got injured who came in between the clashes of uh, the, uh, the police and between the protesting students. So, yeah, and today, uh, especially today, the, the protesting students, uh, they have announced a nationwide shutdown because you, as you have seen, like, this, the protest has now spread across the nation it is not confined to dhaka anymore uh, the, the, the capital anymore so uh, students from all across the countries have uh, come to the streets and they have announced that they're observing a nationwide shutdown yes um, and you know that's going on as we speak right now right as ridwan is reporting members of the border guard of bangladesh which is actually normally responsible for border security, has been sent to five districts across the country to control the law and order situation amid ongoing quota reform movement in Bangladesh. Thanks so much, Ridwan, for joining us with the latest. In other news, the aging monarch in the UK arrived in a golden carriage and put on a bejeweled crown weighing more than a sack of sugar. The new prime minister wore an ordinary suit with a burgundy tie and listened as King Charles III conveyed all that Britain's first Labour government in 14 years wants to do. Britain's King Charles has set out Prime Minister Keir Starmer's legislative agenda, promising a government of service focused on reviving the economy and tackling issues from an acute housing shortage to a cost of living crisis. But Starmer does face a number of daunting challenges, including improving struggling public services with little room for more spending. The speech, by the way, confirmed that the government wants to reset the relationship with the European partners, roiled by Britain's exit from the European Union back in 2020. My government will govern in service to the country. My government's legislative programme will be mission-led and based upon the principles of security, fairness and opportunity for all. Stability will be the cornerstone of my government's economic policy and every decision will be consistent with its fiscal rules. It will legislate to ensure that all significant tax and spending changes are subject to an independent assessment by the Office for Budget Responsibility. And to what many are calling a rare political spectacle, well, we saw smiles and chatter as Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak attended the King's speech under the Labour government. Keir Starmer looked happy and relaxed as he walked into the House of Lords, flanked by opposition leader Rishi Sunak, who spoke animatedly with the new Labour Prime Minister. Well, news and updates continue in a moment, right after this very short break. <laughs> 